Welcome back to Watches Tonight, folks. We've got a little bit of a special on uh, the hopper for the evening. I'm coming to you in a studio overrun by the bituminous effluence of our roof maintenance. While they're one story above us, take my word for it, no one is higher than the crew in this room right now. That said, it smells like Prince William Sound on the morning of March 24th, 1989. We're literally running on fumes here, guys, so this is going to be a rapid fire show to get the guy out. Otherwise, I'm going to have a health inspector on my back. So, tonight, we talk Chanel's purchase of 20% of FP Journe and what it means, whether we should take Cartier seriously as a luxury watch brand, a Rolex versus Tudor family feud, and a test of our faith in modern materials with a frank discussion and look back on ceramics impact in the industry. All of that plus wrist shots on watches tonight this evening, guys. All right, let me quickly fire up the live chat and see how you guys are doing. Uh, by the way, guys, I have to remind you, there is no better place than thewatchbox.com to buy, sell, and trade your luxury watches. I want to remind you that they pay for these pixels. Buy, sell, and trade on watchbox.com. See my videos. We make it fast, we make it fun, and I have a testimonial to give you in a moment. So. I will be giving away a watch. It will be a Bell & Ross, it will be a Tudor, or it will be a Seiko, not Grand, Seiko. So tell me in the comments below this video what you want my next giveaway watch to be. We've given away a Breitling, we've given away an Oris, the next one will be Bell & Ross, Tudor, or Seiko. By your request in my Wednesday special, tell me in the thread below this video what it's gonna be next. Okay, batting practice. Warming up with your pitches and my cuts, the return of time to run, guys. Run far, run fast from these bad watch listings, where we name and shame the worst of the web. Viewer Trevor S. kicks off the comic relief portion of our evening with this Etsy listing for a Jager Le Coult. It's a sweet JLC, guys. I gotta say, Master Ultra Thin Moon Face. Well, Master Ultra Thin Moon Face, um... <laughs> well, sort of, sort of. <laughs> it's it's sort of that, and I have to give him credit for imagination. Uh, the craftsman seems to be going for this. I'm not sure if it's the effect he achieved, but I can see what the reference was, at least. And in Uzbekistan, which is the home of this particular seller, and where apparently real men have real wrist hair, uh, the per capita income is 2100 US dollars, so the $1,200 asking price of this watch probably seems calculated to impress and convince. Uh, but just in case you're in the stands, and you're looking to drop 12 bills on Halloween grade high horology, that's your neighborhood, the stands, then the same seller offers this hardcore hardware from Vacheron Constantin. Same price, same quality. And yes, that one is an automatic. It's self-winding, guys. Uh, that said, if that automatic doesn't get your pulse racing, you'll have plenty of convenient Uzbek cross-border shopping options from and for that other popular automatic sold in the region. Loaded for bear. <laughs> Big game hunting for your wrist. All right, help me name and shame improve the e-commerce ecosystem via survival of the fittest. Send your bad watch listings to me at mondaymailbag at thewatchbox.com. Let me say hi to my friends, Russell996, Watch Yoda, Matsu Ravai, Eric Cecil, Mark S, Shannon from Germany, Edward Ledden from Sweden, PY7, Alexi Simola from Finland, Joshua from London, and Jeff J from our neck of the woods in Manhattan, just up I-95. Okay, Raul asks, Tim, you post a short video, say you're selling your JLC collection, and then you leave us hanging for a week. What's going on? Are you leaving? How can you stop collecting? Uh, guys, I'm going absolutely nowhere, period. And let me be emphatic about that. I have never been more engaged than I am now. If anything, I've gotten a second wind in my sails after four years of doing this. My ambition in watch scholarship as a historian and communicator of our hobby is undiminished. And my passion for watchmaking burns white hot. This is something for which I have hardly scratched the surface. I've also got the ultimate resource in Mike Michaels in-house, so why would I go anywhere else? Aside from reinforcing some personal relationship with friends, family, and colleagues, uh, my public-facing self will not change in any way. So 
I will enjoy a period in which I can focus on becoming a better advocate for the watch collector fraternity and a better communicator of our passion to those outside the community. I still have a collection of less grandiose pieces, so don't worry about me dishing watches. That's absolutely not what I'm doing. Uh, you'll get to see more of my less perhaps impressive pieces, less outwardly impressive, but more emotionally tied pieces. Proof that the hobby can be fun at lower price points. I'm wearing what is fundamentally a very highly developed Valjoux 7750 right now, and guys, I'm having the time of my life with that EZM 1.1. It's gonna be my only watch on air for a while, but I couldn't be more satisfied. And I can also tell you that this watch, which was traded to me as part of my sale of the JLCs to the watch box, is the first watch I have ever purchased from Watch You Want, Govberg, or Watchbox. So for the first time since I started acting as a mouthpiece for this company almost half a decade ago, I can honestly say I am now a satisfied customer. Uh, sorry guys for buying this one, uh, but <laughs> you're gonna hate me. I got it at wholesale value. <laughs> I love you, but I wasn't gonna let this fall into your clutches. All right, I'll also say that I have not sold all my JLCs. My vintage JLC Snowdrop E877 Memovox lugless watch from the 70s is going nowhere. It was the hardest watch in my collection to find, and it will die hard. That one's going to the restoration shop in Le Sentier. I will stay connected to the brand and deeply in love with the big brand where I started. So guys, You'll see that, you'll see my swatches from mom, you'll see my old first job out of college, Bulova Accutron, Grandpa's Omega, and my own graduation Bond Seamaster. I am staying here more a fixture than ever, more excited about the hobby than I have ever been. Thank you for your concern, but once again, this job opening will not be yours. <laughs> okay, as for the watches I sell, I'll always have the memories of those good times. And does anyone really doubt that I've always kept more watches up here than on my wrist. Okay, Paul F. asks, Hi Tim, should I consider the Tudor Black Bay 58 as a real alternative to the no-date Submariner from Rolex? Well, okay, Paul F. saying, Honestly, I can't see any real advantage to getting the Sub, and the price delta seems huge. The price delta is huge. About $3,925. So, Paul, you're not wrong. Prior to this year, the Black Bay was too large, too thick, and too awkward to rival the Rolex sub at anything but five paces, especially the Note 8 sub without the Cyclops eye. That one is exquisitely slim and elegant. But that changed this year with the Black Bay 58. This is a return to the slim and elegant Tudor that looks and feels more like a Rolex, albeit a Rolex made in the 50s. The proper tribute reference is the vintage Tudor 7924, but for all intents and purposes, this is a Tudor that wears like a modern Rolex. The new Black Bay is 12 millimeters thick and 39 millimeters in diameter, which means it matches the 12.6 millimeters and 40 millimeters, respectively, of the Rolex almost to the millimeter. So this is a viable profile and proportion rival to the Rolex. And I should also say the pricing consideration is serious here, as the No Date Sub retails for 7,500, and every dealer, stateside and abroad, is waitlisted for this watch. Watch. Which brings us to our next thought. The Tudor has a 70-hour power reserve to the Rolex's 48, and the Siloxi Rolex hairspring silicon technology found in the Tudor has yet to reach any proper Rolex dive watch. That said, the no-date sub is a submariner. It has the iconic profile, the enduring appeal, and the immunity to planned design obsolescence. The first Rolex submariner owner in 1953 would recognize that thing right there as a sub. I'm not necessarily sure that 50, 60, 70 years in the future, we're still going to recognize the Tudor as an icon. I think it's going to get shuffled periodically, as Tudors tend to. Some folks are also going to be put off by the retro watch pander of the Tudor's design. And like the Chrysler PT Cruiser, which people loved at the time, back in the late 90s, we don't know how the still relatively new retro design watch trend will age. It might date terribly, and that goes double for Tudor's phony Rolex bracelet, which looks like a phony rivet-style Rolex bracelet from the 50s and 60s, but in fact is just a simulacrum or a skeuomorph. So, 
That is weighing against the Tudor for the future if you're taking the long view. And the superior Rolex clasp with the glide lock incremental adjustment definitely needs to be taken into consideration. The Tudor does not have this. And the ceramic bezel insert of the Rolex is going to hold up better over time than the anodized insert on the Tudor, which is probably going to get replaced at your next service. So keep that in mind as well. We're going to return to ceramic in just a moment. Let me give a quick shout out to Tom P. Hey, hey, Jan Wilhelm Koster. I can see Hale Bop. Happy Monday. Marco from Florence. Ryan H. Philip McCrate joining us from Northern Ireland. And I can see right here we've got Simon saying that there is a five year wait list for that Rolex. And Fjord Prefix saying he is not a fan of the fake rivets on the Black Bay bracelet. And that's legit. If you want real rivets on your watch today, you need to go Vianney Halter. Okay, and I can see right here, uh, M. Edmond is joking and laughing that I am juxtaposing the Tudor 58 with a freaking PT Cruiser. Don't laugh. The same sort of easy nostalgia informs the design of each. And like the PT Cruiser, all bets are off concerning how retro is going to age in the watch space once that is no longer cool. And right here I can see Simon saying, Tim, are you calling JLC? A high in the market with your sale. I, I would actually say JLC is so-so right now. I'm not going to give you the breakdown of what I got from my watches, but some were riding higher than others. I will tell you, I didn't spend a cent to own my Tourbillon for the three years I had it. So that worked out well for me. And I can see Mitch Grimes joining us from Atlanta, Georgia. My old haunt and still the home of some family. All right, viewer wrist shots. Russell K., who I believe is watching tonight, opens our account with the ultimate birthday present, a Rolex Sky Dweller steel white gold from his wife taken in London while celebrating. She's a keeper, the watch and your wife. And by the way, Russell, happy birthday. Adam B. keeps it in the Rolex Tudor family with the, his Black Bay GMT from Yosemite National Park in the U.S. just before forest flighters closed that one down. Forest fires are an issue here in the summer now, and I love that NATO, by the way. Chris N. brings watches and wheels back with 007. No, not that one. This is his Seiko SKX 007 with his Porsche 911 Carrera 991 generation. And Jason C. offers a shot of his Daytona, a 116520, double steel. A future heirloom for his son, by his own admission, with a gorgeous Patrizzi-style dial. Absolutely nice. Pfft, your son is a lucky man, or lucky boy. All right, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Let's see what's going on right here. Tim, why did you live in Atlanta? It's where my folks lived when I was a kid. They were both nurses, and I guess the healthcare industry was good down there. And I could see Edward Ledden saying, Dave... He's going to be looking at Nomega Seamaster 300 from the Trilogy Collection. Edward is saying this is probably going to be his first Omega. And uh, Bobby is asking, Tim sold his JLC watches. You're going to have to watch my Wednesday special because that is a whole spiel that I can't rehash here. Just know this. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not ending my collecting. I'm taking a step back to be better to people and better what I do in front of the camera. All right, guys. Greeting from Chicago. Big Mike, welcome aboard. Let's jump right back to the topic of the night. Rudy, you asks, Tim, what does Chanel's purchase of an FP Journe stake mean for FP Journe? Well, nothing. Don't worry. This is not a big deal. Uh, those of us in the industry already knew this was probably happening back at SIHH. And it's important to remember that F.P. Jorn, the man, has always had large equity holders, silent partners most of the time, in his company. Since the very first F.P. Jorn watches were being designed in the late 90s, other people have owned parts of this company. And Chanel has a history as a benign and generous owner with a large checkbook and a large heart for the niche brands that it owns within Swiss watchmaking. Back in 1998, they bought Bell & Ross and they gave them enough money to open their first plant in Switzerland. Before that, they were just a branding exercise based in Paris with the watches made by Zinn. So Bell & Ross became a watchmaker with Chanel money, and the instrument series was designed and launched under Chanel. They own GNF Chatelaine, which makes the best ceramic cases in the business next to Swatch's Commodore, also makes well-known clasps for the likes of Richard Mille, cases for MBNF. Chatelaine has gone from strength to strength under Chanel. It's also important to remember that this kind of financial security is an important thing in an age when groups are doing better and better and small brands are falling farther and farther behind. 
behind. F.P. Jordan weathered the financial crisis. But don't forget, guys, it could always happen again, and the second time, they might not be so lucky. So having that Chanel money is a big deal. Going forward, I'm excited to see what Jorn does with the Chanel money, because he remains the primary watchmaking force. Also remember, Grubel Forsey, 20% of them has been owned for almost a decade by Richemont, and they've been pretty much allowed to do their no-compromise thing. That money, that support has been great for Grubel. At the same time, Richard Mill has always been partly owned by Audemars Piguet since the very beginning. The association with AP has made those top-level Richard Mill watches possible through AP Renault et Papy. So this is a case of Jorn getting the money it needs, the stability it needs, and Chanel getting a quality top-end watchmaker to go along with its partial stake in Romain Gautier, which to date has also worked out quite well. And they've owned a chunk of Romain Gautier since 2011. The logical one was launched under Chanel equity stakeholding. All right, Joe V asks, right here, Tim, what is up with Cartier? Is it a fashion watch or a luxury watch brand? This goes back and forth, guys. If you asked me this question 15 years ago, I would have said Cartier is a fashion watch, and it's primarily a quartz watch for women. After 2004, all of that started to change, and here's why. Cartier is a true luxury watch purveyor today and a highly integrated manufacturer to rival the best like Patek and Audemars Piguet. They can do everything in-house from their sprawling integrated complex at Le Chaux de Fonds. They make their dials, they make their bracelets and clasps, they make their cases, they make their movements, and they do the engineering in-house too. So all of that being said, Ignore the high horology pieces from Cartier. They're great, and if you can buy them for 20 cents on the dollar, well bought. That's what you should probably pay for them. The best Cartier watches are the ones you can buy for under $10,000, and in that price range, they have few equals for innovation or quality. Here are my picks. The 2018 Cartier Santos Large. Guys, this was the story of SIHH 2018 for Cartier, and I'm a believer. I was a skeptic going in. I was a believer after trying the Santos Large, which isn't quite as large as it sounds. It's nicely sized. 9.9 millimeters thick like an AP 15400 Royal Oak Auto. It's 39.8 across the wrist, so 9 to 3. And then it's 47.5 lug to lug. So if you can wear a JLC tribute to 1931, you can wear this thing comfortably. It also has a slightly cambered case like a Richard Mille to curve around your wrist. Quick switch and smart link. You need to know these both. Quick switch is the system from the Cartier Roadster. It's the system IWC uses on the AquaTimer. If you have fingernails, you can swap the strap and bracelet back and forth on your Cartier Santos. That's why I'm showing both of them right there. You can bring them both on vacation. For the surf and the turf, this watch has got you covered. But SmartLink is where Cartier really sets itself apart. This one is all theirs. You can use that same fingernail to remove and replace links in the bracelet. I tried a prototype at SIHH and it blew my mind. I never imagined something that works so well to allow you to dismantle your bracelet without tools would simultaneously have no negative consequence on the manufacturing tolerances or the solidity of the bracelet. Eyes closed, you would never imagine that bracelet comes apart with anything but a screwdriver. This thing is a home run, and I can see it finding its way to every Richemont brand if Cartier is not careful to guard its territory. 100 meters water resistant, automatic with a date. The only sports watch feature this one lacks is Loom. More on that in a moment. By the way, if you want to spend Royal Oak offshore money on your Cartier, this is one of the few cases where I can say spend more than 10 grand on your Cartier. The skeleton, which is hand skeletonized and hand finished and available in full steel, can be had for just over $26,000. Obviously, it's not going to have the resale of Audemars Piguet, but it's also going to have a degree of reliability and serviceability that you don't get with Audemars Piguet, and a toughness inherent in this setup that I would not ascribe to Royal Oak Offshore. A beautiful piece, and by the way, this is not electro spark erosion. This is real hand skeletonized movement manufacture. Okay, drive to Cartier. This one flies under the radar, partly because it's so thin. The drive to Cartier, extra flat, in steel, 39 millimeters in diameter by 6.6 .6 millimeters wide. Think about that. The Royal Oak Jumbo, which we call the extra thin, is 8.2, 8.1 millimeters thick. 
This is 6.6 .6. with a Piaget High Horology MC430 manual wind movement. So you've got a high horology movement in a high horology ultra thin case. In 2017, this became what the drive should have been from the beginning, but it was only available in rose gold and white gold that year. For 2018, you can buy it in steel. And for $5,600, I cannot think of a better luxury watch to buy in the dress watch class than this thing. For $5,600, this has no competition. Think of this as a $5,600 case study in high horology done right. There is no equivalent to this watch. I love it. The Calibre de Cartier Diver Blue. This one came out in 2016. 7,900 US bucks on the strap and worth every penny with a steel case. We saw the Calibre de Cartier in 2010. It was awkward, weirdly proportioned, and not my cup of tea. You guys evidently agreed because Cartier went back to the drawing board and for 2014 we got the Diver. For 2016 we got this watch. Now. It's a hidden gem among dive watches, not just for Cartier, but for the entire industry. It's also the first ceramic bezel on a Cartier diver. The black bezel model has ADLC. This one is ceramic. Superb bezel refinement. It feels like a Blancpain 50 Fathoms or a Grand Seiko dive bezel. And it is wonderfully slim, well under 12 millimeters. It makes a Submariner feel chunky. It makes a Sub feel like a sea dweller. I'll also say this, built for small wrists, you will not find a better 42 millimeter case to wear on a small wrist. This one has side to side arc and camber and it's objectively very compact at just under 48 millimeters lug to lug. I'm blown away by this thing. It's a real IS. So 6425 dive watch. So it's not just a diver in name, it is a diver in fact, and the loom aspect is sensational. Check out my review of this one if you want to see more, but this would probably be the Cartier that I would buy with my own money. All right, primary feature tonight, guys. Let me see some comments that I've got coming in. Um, I can see Ottawa in HD saying, let me ask this, Cartier Santos or Rolex Oyster Perpetual 39? I actually think that the Santos is a more impressive product. I don't feel like the Santos feels cut down or cost cut. With the Oyster Perpetual, I, I do get that feeling a little bit. In the bracelet, in the solidity, in the quality of the clasp, it's one of the few Rolex watches where I'll say I can feel where the money was saved. I would get the Santos. And I can see right here, Alexander Pinheiro saying Rolex Oyster Perpetual from me. Vive la différence. And I can see right here, Josh saying, how about the Pasha with the AP movement? Uh, frankly, there is a whole host of watches made with high horology movements branded as Cartier. We'll visit them another time. We'll do a Cartier mono brand episode on watches live. But I endorse. Okay, good evening from Bobby Smith just joining us. Peter B is saying that it feels nothing like a Blanc Pont 50 Fathom. I felt dozens of each and I beg to differ. Primary feature tonight, ceramic watches. We recently wrapped a versus feature a video shoot for next Sunday's watch comparison on the Reviews channel. So for the first time, we reviewed two full ceramic watches, not those two, Panerai and Grand Seiko. And I took a moment to reflect on how the course of watchmaking's ceramic fortunes have changed. Back in 1985, IWC basically stunned the world with its groundbreaking IWC Da Vinci perpetual calendar chronograph with ceramic case. And Chanel helped to mainstream ceramic with its Circa Y2K Chanel J12, constructed mainly by its partner Chatelaine. This is one of the reasons they bought GNF Chatelaine for the, the J12 series. But by the time the world financial crisis hit in 2008, it really did seem like the material of the future for the entire industry was ceramic, and we'd all be wearing ceramic watches in 2018. Uh, the kiln cooked case looked ready to dominate the watch world, and just as soon as the shrapnel from Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, most of America's Wall Street, and the entire nations of Ireland and Iceland could be extracted from the financial flesh, we'd be back on track, and we'd all be wearing some sort of high-tech ceramic watch. Which brings us to the present, 10 years later. How did that play out? Not as we expected. Frankly, there have been steps back. Where does the one-time wonder material stand today, and who should and should not partake of ceramic? Okay, the best ceramic watch likely was one of the first, 
from a mainstream manufacturer, the Panerai Rodimir uh, PAM292 Black Seal Ceramica. And all derivatives of this case concept, this was as good as it got. It's a sound case study for one of the best examples of ceramic. And wire lugs in metal avoid a common fracture point often seen in the ceramic lug Panerai Luminor and the straight lug Panerai Rodimir 1940 cases. I mention this because these stress risers helped to create the Achilles heel of ceramic, which is its propensity to fracture when worn by regular watch enthusiasts who thought they were getting a tougher version of stainless steel. It didn't quite work out that way. Watches like the full ceramic IWC Miramar and the Panerai Luminor and the Rodimir 1940 are all or nothing, and this came to surprise a lot of collectors who thought they were getting invulnerable watches. Uh, watchmakers tend to discuss these as binary cases, if you will. They're either broken or not broken. That is, they either show no scratches, no marks, or they fracture and you're looking at a case replacement. And even the best ceramic cases, and I do consider the Omega Side of the Moon series to be the best ceramic cases, can break and shatter if dropped. I'll also say that whether owners admit it or not to date, that's how most ceramic cases come to grief. They get dropped, not knocked on a doorknob, not knocked on a car seat belt, not dragged along drywall, dropped from five feet in the air. So Nightmare four-figure Panerai, IWC, and even Omega case replacements have led many collectors to swear off ceramic. Is this a good move? Is this the right move for you? Let's explore this. One of the leaders in the industry, Rolex, as a company, as a Rolex brand, appears to have set limits to its embrace of ceramic. The Rolex approach seems to be embracing a hybrid construction, which is why you'll see ceramic bezels on steel or gold watches, or you'll see ceramic bezel inserts on a really hardcore sports watch, like a Sea Dweller, a GMT, or a sub that might get beat up a little bit. And it's interesting that Tudor, the downmarket cousin brand of Rolex, does employ full ceramic cases, as on the Fast Rider Black Shield. Now, that fits an industry-wide movement towards only seeing a lot of new full ceramic cases on entry-level watches, and that's a little bit of a canary in the coal mine if you're buying in the luxury segment. Bell & Ross, yeah, you're gonna see ceramic cases there. Patek, of course not. So it's like Bell & Ross and Tudor, of course. Patek, of course not. Why is that? Well, we're seeing fewer ceramic watches and even fewer full ceramic bracelets. We're not seeing a whole lot of watches like the PAM 438 Tutanero. So times have changed and the outlook on ceramic has changed. So after more than a decade of frantic forum posts about shattered cases and disaster um, case replacement costs, wither the erstwhile miracle material. Well. I'm gonna push back against the grain and defend zirconium dioxide. I think it's gotten a bum rap, and I think, well, the industry may have recoiled too far overreacting, I think you need to give ceramic careful consideration for your next watch. Here's why. Ceramic gets a bad reputation, deserves a second look. We will never get the full story on a forum. Someone posts a picture of a watch that's shattered. It's their first post on the forum ever. They never have a second. There's never a full accounting of what happened. It's the case broke or the case failed or Omega charged me $1,200 for a new case. It's never, I was taking the thing off my wrist while buzzed after two cocktails. I I dropped the thing on a tile floor and darn it, I blame Omega. It's not Omega's fault. It's probably not IWC's fault and it's probably not Panerai's fault. Most of these horror stories don't include full information and they usually include a seller with some sort of sob story trying to coerce the manufacturer into giving him something for nothing. Do you frequently shatter or fracture sapphire crystals? If the answer is yes, and your watch has all died a horrible death by a disfigured uh, sapphire removal, you know what? That kind of traumatic blow and loss of a luxury watch probably warrants some sort of a G-shock for most of your applications. If you don't normally shatter sapphires on your watch, ceramic's probably right for you because what'll break a sapphire will break a ceramic case and what won't break a sapphire, including a scrape on drywall, a knock from your seatbelt buckle, the cuff of your shirt or jacket, the plastic of your chair, the surface of your desk, none of that is gonna cause a ceramic case to come to grief. So if you're that guy who breaks 
crystals, swear off ceramic. Everyone else, keep it in play. I'm also gonna say shop smart. Not all ceramic is created equal. I mentioned GNF Chatelaine, which makes all of the cases for Chanel, all of the cases for Bell and Ross, the ceramic cases for others. You'll see GNF's little logo on the case. You'll know where it came from. They make great stuff. Commodore, which is Swatch Group's in-house ceramic case manufacturer, incredible stuff. Those are great brands from which to buy ceramic cases. It's also important to remember that you need to shop smarter. After you shopped smart and bought a mainstream brand ceramic case, not some micro brand with a no-name ceramic case, look for shapes that create stress risers. Look for that Panerai Luminor with its 90 degree break from case to lug. It's not bad ceramic, but it's a bad shape for ceramic. That's why I say the wire lug Radiomir with the smooth ceramic case and the metal lugs in wire, the perfect combination for a ceramic watch. Look for stuff like that. Look for the Omega Side of the Moon series where the lugs are blended smoothly or the IWC Top Gun Miramars. Those are good shapes inherently for ceramic. Finally, there's a ton of hype surrounding hardened steel cases. Uh, Damasco has its ice hardening. Zinn has its tegument. Bremont has its BEBA 2000. You need to remember that in the case of Damasco, yes, it's a straight through hardening of the case, but it's only 700 to 800 Vickers. Ceramic is going to be 1200 to 1800, and that is also straight through the case with Zin, they give you a relatively thick coating, but Tegment is still on the surface. Bremont's treatment, which in some applications is 2,000 Vickers, it's only one to two microns thick, which means, yeah, you're okay with a shirt cuff, but anything that would dent or ding a standard 316 steel watch will generally leave a mark on a Bremont case. A little bit harder, and you're going to leave a mark on Tegument. So remember, in those instances where you have a super hard case that's now dented, the only way to refill finish it, in Bremont's case, is going to be replacement of the bezel or replacement of the case. So there's a double-sided sword to those face-hardened steels and face-hardened titaniums. Ceramic doesn't have that problem. What would dent a Zinn or a face-hardened Bremont wouldn't put a mark on an Omega Dark Side of the, the Moon or a BRO3 ceramic from Bell & Ross. So remember, it's not just the hardness of the material on its face, it's the hardness of the material under the material that will allow a collapse into a softened core. You don't get that with ceramic. It's as hard in the center as it is on the surface. Also remember, a lot of watches that are steel or gold or platinum, if dropped, they will dent sufficiently that you will no longer be able to screw the case back in, you will damage the stem tube assembly, or you will damage the interface with the bezel to the point that even though it's not ceramic and it's not fractured, you're still looking at a case replacement. So even metal cases are not invulnerable to the kind of wholesale brutality that leads to ceramic case failures. You can still necessitate a case replacement by denting and deforming metal. So we shouldn't have these prejudices against ceramic. It's not like your watch is made of a graham cracker waiting to shatter. They're pretty tough. For the way 99% of us wear and use our watches, ceramic is just fine and I endorse it wholeheartedly. Also, remember, ceramic banishes scratches and scuffs forever. If you ache with every swirl and cat claw sheetrock scratch on your watch, Consider yourself a candidate for ceramic, and there are better choices for an outright beater watch when you know you're going to leave a mark. SBDC 059, guys. That's the definition of a beater watch. All right, viewer wrist shots. Aaron R. is a man who thinks differently with a Glossuta Original Sport Evo Chrono and his Tesla Model S 2017. I love them both. I would love them both. Francis C. of Singapore, currently in Shanghai, shares his rare BMW 1M and his two-tone Rolex sub, subsequently traded for a Steel Patek 5960 annual calendar flyback chrono with a white dial. Send me a wrist shot of that one, too, please, Francis. Ryan M. of Britain shot this JLC Master Control, my favorite version of that watch, no less. Uh, to answer his email question, should you go for Grand Seiko Spring Drive or Quartz? Go with Spring Drive. It's the most Grand Seiko, Grand Seiko you can buy. And Rahul S. brings down the house and brings down the curtain with his complicated Reverso Sun and Moon. I adore that watch. I may have lost my JLCs, but I have not lost my ardor for the brand. Send your wrist chats to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Comment and subscribe in the description below. And remember, guys, you're telling me in the comments 
below this video, do you want me to raffle off and give you a Bell & Ross, a Tudor, or a Seiko? Let me know, because we're in the final rounds. All right, guys, thank you for joining me. All of my friends online who joined from around the world, if you got up early, if you stayed up late, thank you so much. Thank you to my crew for braving the fumes. <sighs> Time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on. Thank you.